imagine, demand, and build a world transformed. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Scientists Flavor at the World Transformed, our panel on science versus politics, the COVID edition. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us today on what looks to be a lovely sunny Thursday afternoon. We're gonna be joined by Dr. Aisha Raza and Joe Buckley on our panel today. And we're hoping for some really interactive engagement with the topics that we'll be discussing just as a reminder, please try and make sure that we keep this space somewhere where everyone's voice can be heard and engaged with. So make sure to be appropriate, kind and thoughtful in the language that you're using. Um, just as a warning, people who do violate these principles might be prevented from posting in the chat box, which you can use to make your views heard throughout the event. We'll be using a live transcription service called Otter. If you're using Otter, follow the link and open the transcript as a separate window. If you're having difficulties, just message the person who is volunteering in the chat and they will be able to help you out with the accessibility to that. And as a reminder, both that World Transformed um, is being run today by the, support, by the support and contributions of people like yourselves. So you are welcome to get in touch with them to support the work that they're doing. And of course, Scientists Flavor is a voluntary organization and we're always keen to hear from new members and supporters who are interested in the work that we're doing to bring science to the forefront of policy and political decision-making. So to open the event, I'd like to invite Joe Buckley, who is the Treasurer of Scientists for Labour, to say a little bit about what we've been doing so far. Joe, as he will no doubt tell you, is a researcher at University College London, currently working on coronavirus and the mechanism that the COVID uh, virus uses to infect human cells. Joe, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um so I thought I'd start by talking a bit about the science behind coronavirus and how it spread. So um, this is quite inspired by a talk I saw given by Professor Dan Franco at Cambridge University. He um, was explaining that what we know is the coronavirus spreads by when you get close to people and it's spread by breathing it out. And I think everyone's familiar with that. And you might know that um, the COVID is a waterborne disease, so what it does is it's in little droplets in your breath when you breathe out. So these droplets that you breathe out come in different sizes, um, small, medium and large, and the small ones um, are basically free of virus because they're so small, there's so little chance of any virus actually being in these droplets. The large ones, on the other hand, have lots of virus in them, and these are the really dangerous ones. But the good thing about these large ones is that after um, about two meters, they fall onto the ground because they're large and therefore heavy, they fall to the ground quite quickly. So this is why we do social distancing, because beyond two meters, these virus particles can't get any further. These big droplets can't get any further. So there's a third type, which are these medium-sized particles. Now, these can get further than two meters, and social distancing isn't really effective against them. But the good thing is these aren't, don't contain that much COVID. So there's a very low chance of you catching COVID from these medium particles. But it is a risk that we kind of have to accept if we want to do anything but just locking ourselves indoors. So um, when we've seen social distancing, it is for this reason that we want to stop these big particles. Now, you might be thinking, where do face masks come into this? Do the face masks stop these medium-sized particles? And sadly, they don't. Um, and you can test this yourself because these medium-sized particles are about the size of cigarette smoke. So if you go outside wearing a face mask, stand next to someone smoking, and you can smell the smoke, your mask isn't blocking these medium-sized particles. But they do block these large-sized particles, but not as effectively as social distancing. So... Face masks are a good backup if you're going to have to break social distancing. So this is why um, we've got policies in such as you have to wear face masks in supermarkets or you have to wear face masks in um, when you're on the tube because in these situations, you're very likely to break social distancing. Now, um, what you might be thinking here is, well, it, am I saying the government's following good scientific advice with this? And 
the problem with this is the government at one point announced that you don't have to social distance two meters anymore. You only have to social distance by one meter. Now, that one meter has no scientific basis. The two meters rule is a good rule of thumb because we know these large particles are dropped by them. One meter is just made up. And it's um, it's better being one meter away from somebody with COVID than it is being right in the face. But it doesn't offer you the same protection that this two meter rule does. And this kind of touches the point for what our government are doing is it'll bring in things that sound like the scientific but aren't necessarily scientific. And a really good example of this is the rule that was um, brought in on Monday, the six people together. Now, the problem with that rule is it, there's so many exceptions to it. You've got six, no more than six people can gather in one place unless it's a wedding or they're on a football team or it's a funeral. And it's not like COVID knows not to spread at weddings. It's um, it's a real problem. And this six-person rule, like, what's the scientific motivation for that? And I've done some research looking up on it, and I can't find anything concrete that says six is a golden number that you shouldn't be have any more than. So my assumption would be that we thought, okay, we can't just say four people because that's or stop two couples. We want it to be a bit more. Should we say five? And then somebody's gone, nah, five's a bit of a round number. It won't seem scientific. Like, this is the same reason that if you check the weather forecast, there won't be a 50% chance, chance of rain. There'll be a 51% or a 49% chance of rain. People think odd numbers are more scientific. So this is likely where this six uh, meter rules come from. Now, what is the purpose of this? Because you look at it and you look at all the loopholes and how complicated the law is. Like, for example, mingling is illegal according to this rule, which is probably going to be very unenforceable. So have the government brought in this rule to enforce it? It's likely not. So why is the government bringing in this rule? And when you look at it, it's probably to do communication. What this policy is saying is that you can't we need to take coronavirus seriously again. Its rates are picking up, so we'll bring in this law that will communicate that. Now, communicating with people by bringing in laws is a very inefficient way of communication. What would be much better is if we could have a trusted public expert go on TV and say, right, coronavirus is getting serious again. This is what you need to do. But the problem is we've had this government that have completely undermined public trust in experts for years on years. So we don't have trusted public experts that can go on and say, right, this is the situation. This is what you need to do. And the government is so quick to point the blame at any scientist who makes a prediction that turns out not to be right and to try and get all blame off itself on scientists. For, if you've ended up with one tool to communicate any real like danger, and that to bring in bad policies. So it's we're in a situation where we've got a lot of work to be done to build up trust. And you know, when you've got Michael Gove talking about experts in the way he does, it really doesn't. It really leaves us in a bad situation to deal with a crisis like this. Now, on top of this, you've got this whole range of science denial that's been around. So it's from stuff like flat earthers to um, climate change denial to anti-vaxxers. And while that's been a problem for years, I mean, the anti-vaxxing started in the 90s and Flat Earth has been around for as long. But the, what's happened is we've got algorithms that are promoting these theories to the exact type of people who are susceptible to them. Like YouTube wants to keep people on its site as long as possible and maximize its ad revenue. And doing that, they're using algorithms that are detecting the type of material that people will engage with and showing it to them. So people who are naturally leaning to science, uh, science, science denial, naturally leaning towards conspiracy theories, are served up completely loads of content that are just amplifying this denial. And it's not something that's just um, related to science. It's We can see the same thing, seeing how YouTube is radicalizing people to the far right, or how conspiracy theories like um, QAnon have spread in. Because people who are susceptible to these things are being targeted and shown this content, which is leading them to be more radicalized. And this c creates a real problem that we don't have P uh, like we don't have a society that's scientifically literate anyway. And 
I mean, I can give an example of this with myself. Like, I um, used to live in Clapton on my way to work. I used to go past a hipster coffee shop and get a coffee on my way to work. And I once realized that this hipster coffee shop only did um, vegan milk, and I was drinking soy milk. Now, I'd read somewhere that soy was bad for men to drink because it raised your estrogen levels, so you, sh you should try and avoid it. So I started drinking oat milk in my coffee instead. Now, I hate oat milk. It was I was miserable every day getting this coffee. Now, what I know now is that there is no evidence to say that soy actually um, increases estrogen levels in men. What does increase estrogen levels is cow's milk. But this kind of like um, bad information relating to science, even me as a scientist can be full susceptible to it. And I mean, I drink my coffee black now, but it's a case of we need to look at investing and making our people better at understanding science and better at comprehending science and reforming our education system. So we're not teaching science as a point of memorize these facts. It should be a point of learning how to think critically about, um, about the world and everything around it. So I think I'll hand back to Ben now. Perfect, thanks Joe. And I'd like to bring in next Dr. Aisha Raza. So Aisha's been doing all sorts of things during this pandemic, not least of which is helping out with scientists for labor. She's also a counselor, has been helping in the care sector and lecturing some of our um, younger scientists and medics about neuroscience, I believe. So Aisha, if you'd like to maybe say a few words, introduce yourself and then tell us about your experience of the intersections between scientists, science and scientists and politics and politicians. Oh, I don't think we can hear you just now, Aisha. So, bear with. Um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit about um, how the relationship between the, the pond and the science that we're seeing um, comes from a bit of a history, really, because what we've got is that two very, very, we're quite sort of um, separate from everything else and we feel quite elitist. Um, we all know that, well, those of us who are scientists um, will know that it's highly political um, departmental structures and institutional structures that go on um, in academia. So we, we're up against that. Um, and also in politics, obviously, the similar sort of thing happens. So when these two worlds kind of collide, uh, we're on a bit of a trajectory to uh, get up to all sorts of uh, things where people feel that they can't work with each other very, very effectively. Um, my, my big uh, issue here is that um, that that interface is hugely, hugely important because when we think about things, um, when, when, say, future civil are ever um, portrayed in our um, uh, cultural things like TV or on stage or um, in various ways. Um, it, it's always led by, but what we're finding at the moment is that it's led by um, the sort of capitalist economy. So these two things are completely sort of at loggerheads almost, where our science is driven by the finance. Um, and that sort of has happened, uh, snowballed quite a lot recently in this country, um, particularly over the last sort of 10, 15 years, we've start, kind of seen structures change completely so that it is driven by cash. So when we do see blue, uh, blue sky science, it's coming from people like sort of Elon Musk, or it's coming from people like Bill Gates, funding things obviously with their agenda. So when we suddenly have science being pushed by an agenda, that's when it gets politicised, that's when it becomes not for the common good. Um, we don't know what the driving forces for these things are. Um, and then we enter the murky world of how the media plugs into this and how communication is also plugging into this to try and drive science into a particular um, direction. All of this came into very, very sharp focus with this whole crisis. Um, so as you can see by my little name thingy, um, I'm in local government. So when we, um, when, the, when the pandemic first sort of kicked off, there we were trying to help tease, um, but not getting any information. So it was almost like the information was completely kept from us and strangled from us. Um, and without the data, we were kind of like uh, going at it completely blind. 
Um, so that sort of who holds the data is very important. Um, and how quickly that comes down to the grassroots is very important. Um, overall, I think the whole thing was quite bizarre in that um, why weren't our experts engaged sooner? Um, we are world leaders in things like disaster management. We've got people like the Red Cross and Oxfam and all of these people have expertise, scientific expertise and um, engineering expertise, things logistical expertise. Why weren't we actually getting involved with them how we can cope with this um, a crisis? Because it was a crisis. We're hearing of things from the ground, from actual residents, from care homes, from the NHS, um, and, and almost completely unable to do anything about it because we were waiting to hear from above what, what we could do. Um, and so this kind of disconnect, this kind of silo working of where everybody was very, very sharp helped their expertise or their speciality, I think led to a, a massive catastrophe that we saw. Um, so we had Sage, then we had Indie Sage, and we found that the two, even now, why isn't Indie Sage being involved in the decision making? Um, so there's a real kind of massive disconnect of of the, these and because of that i think the the main losers will be the the general public where we end up with very very disarticulated things going on like just now with all this testing so we're seeing it play out it's like a car crash in slow motion and it's simply because we haven't really ironed this out and the underlying cause of all of this i think um, definitely to do with education. Science education in this country has tanked. Um, when you talk to people on the street or when you're generally uh, approached by residents, their understanding of science is so basic, it's actually embarrassing um, how people tell you um, things about viruses, things about how you can catch it. This whole thing about um, bleach being able to be administered some kind of treatment. Um, and I mean, these things are very, very worrying that our national science awareness is very, very low. Um, and that obviously due to austerity and the issues that we've had in education as well as higher education um, has had a huge, huge part to play for that. Um, so that's basically the things that I've put, uh, the things that I also picked up was um, countries like Africa, in Africa and in, in the Far East are managing so much better to handle um, the pandemic than we are. And is that because they are used to um, crisis far better than us and we've got quite complacent. Um, we don't engage with um, the science as quickly as we should. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot of work to be done on that. Um, and I think, oh, of course, the silver bullet, which is the vaccine. Everybody's talking about um, how suddenly, instantaneously, on demand, um, science is supposed to produce a vaccine that's going to save the universe but we haven't invested in the laboratories that might actually have done that and naturally um, we don't have people who can work in those laboratories um, and if they are there then they, it was all, almost like that this whole testing thing has also brought that to light is that they want to rustle up just like they wanted to rustle up thousands of doctors and nurses they suddenly need to rustle up all these scientists but it takes time to train everybody and we haven't invested in this at all so bottom line on all of this was communication key as well as education so these two things i think the labor party really needs to put out ahead with this and bring it to the fore because um i know we had the whole education education bit but science education is just nowhere things like why do we have at the end of the news, I know I'm going to upset a lot of people, but um, we talk about the the sports bulletin. Why is there not a science bulletin? Why is Laura Kunzberg telling us about science now when actually there's some perfectly good scientists who can go out there and tell you all about what's going on? So there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of places where we can do it. And us as scientists really need to engage into that political process because I find I'm a lone voice quite often. Um, being the artist in the room who can possibly understand what's going on against actually a barrage of people who don't understand what the situation is, let alone how we go about fixing it. 
So I think I'll stop there because I'm sure there's plenty more to discuss in the discussion. So thank you. And I hope you heard all of that because the tech... Thanks, Sasha. That was really great to hear your perspectives, I guess, obviously, as someone who not only cuts across the science and politi policy politics side of things, <laughs> but also from the research to the care side. So thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. Before we open up to the question and answer, what I thought I might do briefly is just tell you all about some of the work that we've been doing and how we've seen in Scientists for Labour, the science meets policy and the scientists meet politicians angle coming through on things. So back in, in March, when this all sort of really started kicking off, for the, for the most part, we were very keen to, to not get too involved, actually, and to trust the government and trust the government scientists to deliver on the advice. But it became quite clear that there was a disconnect between what the scientists were saying and what the government was doing. So as a result, we started doing briefings of the latest scientific research for members of the Shadow Cabinet, and eventually about 200 MPs and peers started reading them it became quite obvious that although lots of people were engaged with the coronavirus topic, there was lack of fundamental science literacy, both amongst, as I just said, the public, but also within the party with so few trained scientists in parliament, it was a real challenge, you know, with full respect to some of the policymakers to get their heads around what was going on. So we decided to, to spend quite a lot of time, we had about 150 volunteers working on producing these briefings and trying to get as many people in the Labour Party, especially the policymakers, up to speed with what was going on. So now we find ourselves in a position where, unfortunately, some of the things which in, in March we had thought, to, you know, the government's got six months to deal with, their scientific issues, they'll be able to get their heads around them, were more or less ignored. And now things are at a position where we see them coming to a head, urgent action is needed, but unlike at the start of the crisis, these issues were things that were inherently predictable. So, for example, I'm talking about the A-level results fiasco or about concerns over the returns to university campus. All of these things, are stuff that the government really should have been on board with. The scientists were telling them what the results were, that the concerns were with universities returning. Educators and teachers were telling them about the concerns of the A-level system that the government was putting in place, but, but none of this was listened to. And I think, as Aisha said, it really highlights the need for better science and scientific literacy, both within the public, but also perhaps more crucially within the policymakers who we rely on to make these decisions for us. So with regard to Scientists for Labour's work, obviously we can do that, but it's also really important that people within the Labour Party consider science as a core part of what they're talking about, rather than just as a sort of extra or an addendum to be talked about in relation specifically to COVID issues. Because so much of what we do, the science versus politics, will not just cut through on the COVID issue, but on issues relating to inequality, issues relating to climate change or education. So it's really great to be able to talk to you all here today and you know, to hear a little bit about your thoughts, but also to try and understand more about what we can do to support science and scientific literacy, both within the party and beyond. Because at the end of the day, the big global challenges of tomorrow are challenges that require us to think at an intersection of both science and politics. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Do we have a science denial problem or a corruption problem? Really good question, actually. We've obviously seen some controversial uh, moves on both the part of the government and on the part of some of their private co contractor colleagues. Um, Aisha, do you want to open with that? Do you, do you think it's one or the other or perhaps a mixture of both? Um, the whole de denial thing I'm seeing quite strongly, actually. Um, we had a guy who was having some work done just a, a couple of doors down from us. Uh, he came along and he said, oh, it's all just made up, isn't it? Because it's another way to try and uh, how to sort of uh, have power over us and tell us what to do and what not to do. So, of course, he was dancing around without a mask or without anything complete. This is a way. So, uh, communication, and I think that... Oh, I think we've lost you, Aisha. I'm a deniers. Do you maybe want to try restarting your internet connection and we'll go to Joe first on, on this one? Um, 
So I think the science denial and the corruption things of are kind of... Okay. Um, I think the science denial and the corruption things are two issues that are a bit separate. Like, um, I mean, last uh, weekend I was visiting some family and um, this uh, bloke came up to us, 88 years old, came up, stood right next to us and told me the, the coronavirus was a hoax. And it was kind of horrifying to see that. So um, I think it's a real problem. And I think people want to believe that there's no virus. They want to believe it's a government's um, like conspiracy because it's it's nicer to think that the world is controlled and what, when life is controllable, but it's inherently chaotic. I mean, there is no... We, we are weak in this world and there is nothing we can do about it. And the biggest, some of the biggest impacts on human history has been viruses and microbes rather than like any actions of a single human. But I do think that we do see that um, generally the, the science you hear about is by big corporations. You don't hear about um, what some researcher has, has done at, say, um, St. Andrews or something like that. What you hear about is like what Elon Musk has done. Or, you know, if, if I was to ask people to name a, 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 a company that does scientific research, I think one of the first names to mind would be Monsanto, who were like the stereotype of an evil company. And this does kind of create a problem with um, with the public perception of science. But we are in a strange way that um, scientists themselves manage to be kind of separated from all this. Now, even though there's a problem with science denial, um, scientists are among the most trusted of any profession. I think we're up there with um, with teachers in and about 70 to 80% of people trust us compared to, say, something like politicians where only about 10% of people trust them. So we there are... Um, some glimmers of hope, but I think that there is a huge problem with institutions. So um, I should probably be careful what I say, but for example, um, UCL, where where I'm at, spends um, most of like a hell of a lot more money doing property development than it does on research. And um, it's got, like, there's always big fallouts in our in academia about the way that our institutions are run like private companies. But I think that doesn't impact the actual sciences of, um, it's a, it impacts what science gets done, but it doesn't impact science in a sort of ethereal sense, which I think we are kind of lucky about the way that um, science is kind of like, scientists are kind of separated from the institutions. Cheers, Joe. Thank you for that. Uh, Aisha, do you want to, to jump back in if you're if you're back with us? No. Okay. Um, well, if you if you do, just just let us know, and we're happy to to bring you back in on that one. In in terms of my thoughts on this, I think you're 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 right that we do have a problem with science denial. I mean, I remember quite clearly the prime minister saying he'd gone into a hospital and shook hands with the coronavirus patients at the start of this, you know, probably not good for his physical well-being and almost certainly not good for their mental well-being um, to be visited by Boris Johnson while you're in hospital. Slight terrifying thought. But that's also perhaps somewhat separate to the corruption problem, but linked in that they both come about from a lack of understanding. So, you know, back in Sorry, May... I didn't catch any of that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, was that you, Aisha? Okay, I'll carry on and we'll, we can bring you in on the end, at, the, at the end if we get a chance. Um, so we forget the government spent 16 million pounds on antibody tests that didn't work. We forget the government spent many millions of pounds on a contact tracing app that didn't work. These are in some ways problems which you might not necessarily call extreme corruption, but perhaps significant conflicts of interest brought about by certain people in government, perhaps having certain links to the people working on these projects. but. But more importantly, it betrays a lack of scientific understanding of what's going on. So, 
you know, at some level, I think the prime minister probably believes that he is following the science rather than actively denying it. The trouble is that when you have no understanding of the scientific method or how science or scientists work, it's quite difficult to tell when someone is selling you snake oil and when someone's selling you a legitimate scientific project. So we, we, we've got to improve that to avoid not only wasting tens of millions of pounds of public money, but also ensuring that we don't end up unintentionally denying the, the, the true, the real science, as it were, for the sake of pursuing projects which sound like they might be an advantageous or good thing to do without actually having any real basis in that advantage whatsoever. So Aisha, if you're, if you're back with us and can, would you like to jump in on this question? Science denial or a corruption problem? Um, there's probably a, um, a vast amount of science denial. I'm afraid my, despite sitting next to my router, I'm not actually getting the whole of your conversation. So I wasn't. Maybe I show what would work if I don't know if it's possible, but uh, perhaps if you could if you could even type your thoughts out into the uh, into the chat, and then maybe one of the tech volunteers can help us can post this so everyone can hear what you have to say, even if they can't actually hear you. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, if I try and do any more on this, it'll probably just crash out completely. I can just about hear you now. Perfect. Well, of course, please do feel free to share your thoughts in the chat if that's if that's easier for you to access. Uh, so another great question. We need to improve science communication to the general public. And this is something where it, it's not only clear it needs to happen, but it, it, it's not yet clear exactly where the greatest needs are. So as a bit of background, we did a report on, on racial inequality. So the fact that people from ethnic minorities are more strongly affected by this virus. And Part of the problem that we found was that there's very little data on health literacy and how well people understand the science, especially in communities where um, first generation immigrants or people with English as a second language are, are living and prevalent. So we do need to think about that. I think what the first step has got to be applying some science to the way that we do science communication and looking long and hard at where our messaging is working and where it isn't working. So people will obviously pick out countries that have done very well in this pandemic. You know, many of them low and middle income countries, places like Vietnam, Senegal, and, and a lot of them have really taken the messaging angle much more strongly than we have in the UK, or indeed that has gone down in the US where we see confused messaging, we see devolved messaging that doesn't add up, we see messaging that doesn't engage with the science and doesn't engage with the realities that people are experiencing. So I think the first thing we need to do is really sit down and figure out where the messaging has failed. You know, behavioral sciences are a real science, the government might not recognize that, but we need to stop and figure out why the messaging isn't working at the moment. Is it simply because people don't understand the science? Is it because they don't trust the government? Is it because they're getting conflicting or confusing messages from different sources? Because all of those have a different set of problems. At a more fundamental level, obviously, I think this points to multiple things. The first is that science education in this country is not prioritized the way that I think many academics, scientists, or teachers would like to see it, certainly compared to other countries, either in the developing world or, or often in East Asia or Scandinavia that are highlighted as examples. And the second is it's difficult for policymakers to communicate the science when they don't actually understand it themselves. So I think one, one key thing that we as Scientists for Labour have highlighted is it's vital to get more scientists involved in policy and politics and more politicians and policymakers involved in understanding the way science works. Because you can only tackle this sort of thing both with a top down and a bottom up approach, I think. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? How are we going to improve science communication and what specifically are the issues that we need to discuss and engage with? I think there's a real issue on um, it. Basically, if you get any kind of pundit on TV to talk about anything, so whether it's a political pundit, whether it's a sports commentator, whether anything, and you ask them to make a prediction, what what they're going to do is tell you something outlandish and say they're certain of it having happening because their incentives is to make ridiculous claims that are newsworthy and okay that's entertaining that guy said 
the moon's going to fall down tomorrow. That kind of thing is going to make be more watchable than hearing some reasoned expert say, oh, there's um, about a 30% chance of this happening, or we think this is going to happen, but we've got this amount of uncertainty about it. And this kind of discourse means that when scientists go and try and communicate their findings, they use um, scientific language and they say, we think this might happen, our theory is this, and the evidence suggests that it might be this. And the reason we use that language is because we're trying to communicate something that has a lot of uncertainty around it. Now, that uncertainty doesn't mean it's wrong. So, for example, global warming is a, a very good example of it. We are 100% certain, well, as close to 100% certain as anyone can be about anything, that the greenhouse effect is real. And that, um, that um, chemicals like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere w increase the temperature of the Earth. We can test this. It's been We've known this uh, for about 150, 200 years now. What we're less certain of, um, we're also certain that human action is contributing to CO2 being added to the atmosphere. What we're less certain about is knowing this, um, how much CO2 is going to be put in the atmosphere over the next 10 years, and how much this is going to relate to a global temperature change, and how this global temperature change is going to um, relate to what we actually see on Earth. Like, is a one-degree temperature change going to cause the ice um, caps to melt? P possibly. But... When we're talking about things with this level of uncertainty, people will think, oh, it's uncertain. We shouldn't do anything about it. They only said they're like, they're not confident this is going to happen. But the thing is, we are more confident that if we keep polluting, that the temperature is going to increase than if we keep polluting, the temperature is going to stay the same. And because we're trying to make predictions about incredibly complex systems, like we're trying to predict the climate of the world, it's huge, like we can't even predict the weather tomorrow that accurately, How it's such a difficult challenge, but we can see that, okay, this is a real problem, we need to start taking it seriously. But if I go on TV and start talking about these problems in this language, and people are going to hear it and say, oh, we're a bit unsure about it, it's not that big a deal, we don't need to take it that seriously. So in order to have um, politicians react to what I'm doing, I need to make predictions that say the temp global temperatures are going to rise by one degree in 10 years, and I'm certain of that. Now, I can't be certain of that. So when I say that, if in 10 years it turns out that I'm wrong, well, the politicians say, well, you're completely wrong about this. You're making it up. We shouldn't listen to you. So this is the real challenge we have is if we use scientific language, we can't get we we won't make the change we need to change if we've only been talking about climate change in purely scientific language communicating the uncertainty nothing would ever be done about it but on the other hand if we don't use scientific language and we make these predictions people can say oh you were wrong and that's how you end up with people saying well he predicted it was going to be one degree and there was no change and okay maybe there was no change so for example between um, 1998 and 2008, 2008, global temperatures actually decreased, but that was due to the sun getting temporarily cooler due to um, certain behaviours of the sun. Now, between 2008 and 2018, we've way more than made up for it. But if you're, if I made that pred a prediction over that 10-year interval between 98 and 2008, I would look like I didn't know what I'm on about. And you might have justification for like, oh, then he must be completely wrong. So this is the real challenge we face. We have to use uncertainty. But if we use uncertainty, people will not take things as seriously. And it's a kind of fight that we've got to do. And if we have politicians that understood that, okay, when a scientist says that this is happening, but there's this kind of uncertainty, it doesn't mean that they are just guessing. It means that we need to take this seriously, but because things are so complex, something completely unexpected could happen, and it might be wrong in the short term. But if I was to make a prediction that in 100 years' time, the climate is going to be hotter than it is today, I am almost certain that that would be right. However, if I would say that um, in, a year, in 10 years' time, the climate's going to be one degree hotter, that is impossible to make an accurate prediction on. So this is we need the literacy to understand that 
these predictions made by scientists are subject to a lot of failures. Like, I might not be able to predict um, what's going to happen in a certain football game, but I can predict that, um, you know, someone like Liverpool is probably going to be towards the top of the Premier League at the end of the season. But I can't say what's going to happen in their game next week. And we need to kind of understand this with prediction. It's so difficult to, to do accurately. Cheers, Joe. Um, so let's let's move on to another question now. What are we going to do to push back against the social norms that the government has embedded when it comes to COVID? Interesting. Would the person who asked that question mind explaining perhaps in the chat exactly what they mean? Are there in norms, do you mean in terms of social distancing or mask wearing or 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 in terms of other things? I'd be interested to know what your thoughts were on that. And another comment, exactly, we need to see more in the way of direct communication by TV and radio. And I think, you know, the government scrapping its daily press conferences probably hasn't helped a huge amount. Um, Aisha, if you're, if you're able to and you've got the bandwidth, do you maybe want to try coming in? I'm guessing that in your role as counsellor, you often engage with people who are, you know, vulnerable or, or, or reduced access to sort of television and newspaper news. Has there been a problem in getting coherent and clear messaging out to the community in the middle of this crisis? Sorry, could you say that again? It just Yeah, so in, in your role as counsellor, presumably you interact with people who are vulnerable or have reduced access to the media for I whatever reason be that. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, Joe, do you have any, any thoughts on this particular topic? So I think a lot of this is actually going to where people are um, and talking to them on that. Now, I, I remember a, a few years ago, I, I was reading a lot about the Cuban healthcare system, which is fascinating when you look at it. Its outcomes are roughly similar to um, the U.S. healthcare system, and I mean that's not necessarily the, a great standard to hold it to. But given that the Cuban healthcare system is massively underfunded and had um, and has like at, at one point it couldn't get access to the drugs that uh, the WHO said were absolutely essential drugs. Now it got these outcomes by having to work in these constraints and be innovative. Now the with the NHS, like we can just throw money at the problem. Well, the UK is a rich country, and we can get away with just okay. Let's just spend money until things get good enough. But Cuba didn't have that luxury. So the things they used to do with their doctors is um, the doc doctors during their training would have to go out and spend time in these small um, rural communities, and they would go. They'd see a health problem. They go in as a doctor, say, oh, you need to do this. And then the person will be like, no, I, I, don't, I don't trust you. That's not the way we do it. And it meant that the healthcare workers had to learn the sort of customs of the people and learn the sort of ways that these communities worked in order to communicate efficiently with them. So they, would, they realized that if I go in and say, I'm, I'm a doctor, I know better, people might not listen to you. But if you can um, understand where people are coming from and connect to them on a level like that and ha have a dialogue with them, then it's much easier to tell people this is um, this is the science. Now, like it, it's what the best place for doing science education, I, if it wasn't during a global pandemic, would be places like uh, local pubs and. Um, and community centers like that, where you can chat to people on their level, as opposed to seeing, you know, some celebrity doctor on TV. And it's about having um, people in the communities that are trusted, that have this kind of, um, can form this connection with people and have this knowledge. Now, the reason that's a problem is you look at, say, take, I'm from Doncaster, and how many scientists are living in Doncaster? Well, probably not that much because there's not really job prospects for scientists there. So you get a situation where, you know, London is full of scientists, Oxford is full of scientists, Cambridge is full of scientists. But in these working class communities, there aren't people in the community with their expertise. 
So when someone from Doncaster is listening to a scientist on TV, it's always um, some posh southerner from Oxford telling them what to do. And people find it harder to take that in than listening to um, someone on their level. Then when their mate in the pub says to them, oh, um, I heard this, I heard COVID's a hoax, the, the, the person has a more tendency to believe that their mate who they know well than someone they look at that they can feel no affiliation to. So this taps into a fundamental way of the structure of our society. That basically, if you want to be a scientist, you leave your hometown and you move to somewhere like London. And, you know, there's not many job prospects for you to go back. So people in those communities don't know scientists and don't see them in their everyday lives. So it's, um, and scientists, science is something that's kind of hidden away in society. And it, it means that when we have to be right, right, listen to us, we don't have people we can put forward. Now, um, if you look at the, um, say the HIV epidemic, now that like, um, that was not dealt with well in America, but one thing that America did kind of well was that they had one person who was, this is the person who's always going to talk about HIV in um, uh, Anthony, Anthony Fausti, I believe. And having that single source of authority who would go out, go on TV and only say scientific advice. Now, again, there was a lot of bad handling of the uh, AIDS epidemic, but having that single point of communication, someone you can trust, proved very helpful. Now, we don't have that for COVID. You've got, um, the, uh, the, um, like, I, I can't off the top of my head bring to mind the names of a chief scientific advisor to the government. And they are not somebody who you look at and you become familiar with. And in a pandemic, what you need is somebody you can become familiar with and be like, oh, that's the science person on TV. I better listen to what he says. And that's why we have to use instruments such as policy to do communication because we don't have trusted household figures that uh, this person is someone I can trust to tell me what I need to do. Cheers, Joe. Um, thank you for that. I think it highlights the importance of both having, you know, scientific role models, but also trusted scientific personalities who are able to communicate this to people in a way that they understand rather than in a way we think they ought to understand. Uh, we're almost we're coming up on time now, so I was wondering if, if Joe, you might have any closing comments you'd like to make, or any last-minute questions that people would like to put in the chat. Um, I, I think um, looking at the social norms question is quite an interesting um, idea that, like, no one really knows what they're doing, and I, um, I. For example, just pubs as an example. Now, I've seen pubs where you take it very seriously. You come in, to, um, you come in, you have to give all your details. They give you like a briefing as you're walking in. This is how it works. They have like one-way systems, and it's um, it's something that, that's well enforced. On the other hand, um, there's I've seen pubs where it's just like normal. It's like you go up to the bar, you're queuing up, and there's no change. And I think this reflects that there isn't really government standards and you need, like, this is a situation where you need government to be clear and be like, right, things need to be organised this way. It's like wearing a mask in shops, bringing that in, it was far too late to be brought in, but when it was brought in, it's like, oh, okay, this is clarity, I need to wear masks in shops now. And while ever the, um, the sort of lack of clarity or, like, Boris Johnson is changing how far we need to social distance. People can get this kind of confusion and, be, and the default state when you're confused is to kind of, oh, okay, I'll just behave normally. It's, it's an interesting problem because we need to be very clear and give very simple advice. And as soon as we start saying, oh, no more than six people, but except for this case and this case and this case and this case, you start to be like, oh, okay, well, I don't really, um, oh, this is confusing. I guess we've just six of us meet up and it might be okay anyway. And this is really dangerous. Like, you need to have clear and simple advice. And this is one thing that, like, needs to be pushed on a lot is be as simple as possible, be as clear as possible. Cheers, Joe. 
thank you. Do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make on this or anything that you'd like to point people in the direction of? What are good things to be to be doing to tackle some of the problems that you've said? Should we be engaging scientists in CLP meetings? Should we be encouraging more people to talk to their, their local scientists if they've got one to find out some more about the, uh, the topics that we've talked about here today? I, I think... Um... I think there's a problem that there isn't really... The, the thing that's important to understand about science is not knowing facts or knowing that, like, you know, knowing the Earth goes around the sun, like, isn't really that useful in your day-to-day -day life. What is useful is understanding how science works and the scientific method. And it's a great example of the idea of government saying they're following the science, but... In, in my belief, if you're following the science, you make all your data publicly available so other people can almost audit it and check it. And um, like at the start of the crisis, when we thought herd immunity was a thing, we found out that's because somebody had made a mistake and was um, modeling um, based on um, viral pneumonia instead of COVID. Now, mistakes happen. I make them all the time in my work. But... We have the scientific method, so when somebody makes a mistake, it can be caught and be like, oh, you've done this wrong, you can go fix it. So what the issue is, is the government would be in secret, not telling the advice, and nobody could pick up on the mistake. And this is why, you know, these, it is really important for that we work openly and we share our information. And science is, isn't about getting things right. It's about making a guess that kind of makes sense getting reasonable results testing them and if your guess was wrong it, throwing it out and starting again now as somebody who's a practicing science like the biggest part of my job is realizing that the thing i've been working on for the last three months isn't working and throwing it all away and starting again and it's a process of trying something testing it and improving and we during the crisis we have to kind of do this it's like okay let's try this this and this and like okay this hasn't worked we need to be adaptive but there's so much in politics of like not making a u-turn whereas science is basically like making constant u-turns until you find something that works and i think this is um what people need to understand when a scientist gets something wrong you shouldn't be like ha you got it wrong you should be like, oh, you got that wrong. And so the scientist, if it's a good scientist, should be like, oh, okay, yeah, we can change that. And have this is why science and politics don't go very well together, is because politicians will not admit the wrong. And by the time they've done it, it's been too late. And then if you're the scientist and you said, okay, we thought this, but now we know better, you need to do this. And the politician's like, well, I just announced that. I can't go back and change it. So it's a sort of politics as a ultimate is the ultimate hostile environment for doing science in now there's a lot to, we can do to improve that but what's important for people to take away is that science isn't about getting things right the first time it's about getting a bit closer to the truth each time cheers joe thanks so much um i sure I, I i guess i you're welcome to try again but perhaps the internet's not up to it um, I hope we'll be able to, to 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 bring you back at some point in the future to hear Hello. your thoughts yes. on the best. Oh, um, I oh think okay. I, I do agree with actually been listening. I was going to say similar things to what Joe has just said about how it is the ultimate hostile environment for science. Um, I've been banging my head on this for a while now, trying to get more women in STEM and stuff involved in politics via various um, sort of different outfits and um, it's always failed simply because people just don't understand um, what what we're trying how science works and the only thing I can come up with is that we really really need to push science in schools I know it's probably a generation before it's going to be better but we really really need to make sure that if, all the kids that are coming through now are actually understanding the things that we need them to understand because if they all turn into a generation of climate deniers, we're in trouble. Yeah, you're very true. And it's that's very true, Aisha. Obviously, the, cha the challenges, as we said, of tomorrow, whether it be climate change or future pandemics, will all require scientists to be engaged with policy and politicians to be understanding and engaged with science.
I think it's uh, it's about time to wrap it up, but I just want to say thank you all so much for coming along today and for contributing your time and your thoughts and your questions. Uh, and I'd like to say I'm so sorry. This has been so pants. I'm so sorry. Not at all, not to worry. Just as a, a reminder, there's a community forum that's been set up. So you can click on the link that we posted in the chat and register, or you can email info at theworldtransformed.com org if you want to continue some of the conversations that you've heard today. There are other events going on at TWT 2020, so you're welcome to sign up for those and register. And of course, Scientists for Labour have events going on throughout the conference period, including, including hosting our patron and former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Dr. Gordon Brown, this Sunday at 7pm. You're all more than welcome to attend. And just one more time, if you've enjoyed this session, you'd like to continue your work, you're welcome to support either The World Transformed or um, Scientists for Labour. We're always keen to hear from new members, have new ideas and contribute to policy in new and exciting ways. Thank you all very much. And I hope you have a lovely Thursday afternoon. View the full TWT20 programme and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org